this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Just a, a short video here before we get into the ninth chapter of Romans. It's a pretty heavy chapter. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, said Paul, Galatians 1.15, his timing, when it pleased God. John 1, 1, 13, both his will and his timing. John 1, 13, born again by the will of God, not the will of man or the will of the flesh. So we see in Galatians 1, 15 and John 1, 13, both God's will and timing, both. And we have a... A religious system that says it, just the opposite of that it says it's your will your timing so how can there be or how can there not be conflict within that world religious system it's based on human merit when the truth is openly shared when we when we share our testimony concerning what Christ has done not what we did for Christ but what Christ did for us the truth folks is that there will be conflict the truth is that there should be it, it was purpose that there would be we can know that we are preaching the truth by the response that we'll receive people write me saying you know Steve my church is probably gonna kick me out or you know I may have to leave my church as if there's something wrong with them Dearly beloved, that is the norm when we come to realize these precious truths. We are all outcasts, despised, rejected, reckoned as sheep to be slaughtered. We're surrounded by a religious system based on human merit. But God has called us out of it to be separate from it, not necessarily in body, but as it concerns doctrine. You will have conflict. If there's no conflict, then we are not reckoned as sheep to be slaughtered. God purposed that there would be conflict. There's nothing wrong with you. The Revelation 3.16 describes the condition of the church in the days prior to our Lord's return. It's a church holding forth a certain message. If you look at the text, if you examine it closely, you'll, you'll notice the word work there in the text is in the text is in the singular a close examination of that text reveals that it is the message that's vomited out not individual Christians as so many believe and the overcomers are those for whom Christ died we we have overcome because he died in our place no one's able to overcome on their own I know of a man who never left his house except to eat who never gave a message, delivered a sermon or, or, or a testimony, and he wrote Strong's Concordance. At the judgment seat of Christ, Bema, the entire life's work, again, that's singular in the Greek, of a Christian can go up in smoke, hay, wood, and stubble. Yet nevertheless, he shall be saved, yet so as through fire, well, so much for lordship salvation. And folks, you need to let it sink in that falsehood often takes on the appearance of godliness. It will appear as light when it is not. Why do people want to impose rules on people and, and basically turn all of this into a competition? Because it's all about exalting one's self, the flesh. It's programmed into our psyche from birth. Hard work deserves recognition. We gotta be winners, not losers. As well as the opposite, those who don't achieve success, well, they're failures. The problem with that is it absolutely does not apply to the Christian life. Our position, our standing, our walk, our victory is in Christ. He always causes us to triumph. And he has promised to complete the work that he began in us. He's the only one deserving of all honor and praise. 
He's our life, our message, and our ministry. A lukewarm church gathering fellowship ministry is one that halts between two opinions, mixes law and grace, is content with contradiction, is con unconcerned about the life and, and the power of godliness, that is how it's accomplished on the human level, or from whence it comes, the righteousness of God not based on works, human merit, but the faithfulness of Christ, not I but Christ, it views itself as the vine when it is the conduit, the branch. It takes up the external form of it all, yet it has no real thought about the glory of God. It has no interest in the life of Christ. It's focused on the flesh, the old man, not the embodiment of grace and truth or the new man. It has an appearance of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. Lukewarm in the sense of distasteful, sickening, the opposite of refreshing, because it is flesh, not spirit, law, not grace, self, not Christ. Examine what the text says that they are, need, they are in need of in that letter to the Laodiceans. To place a yoke of, of bondage upon one for whom Christ has died and freed, freed from sin and the law, when we are told not to become entangled in that again, is in itself Laodicean. It's not a Christian's failure to perform that's being spewed out of our Lord's mouth, but the tasteless, sickening message that righteousness comes through our own efforts, our own works, our own strength. That is what the Lord spews out of his mouth. A brother wrote to me telling me how his, his, his pastor wanted him to put his testimony in writing, when in fact he was giving them his testimony that testimony being what Christ had done. I believe what the pastor wanted was some statement of dogma from him that was in agreement with the position of, the, of his ministry, the ministry of condemnation and self, law. Adam was alive. Adam sinned. Adam died. In Adam, all men died. When Christ died, all men were made alive. Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. When the law came in, said Paul, sin revived and I died. What happened? He died in his own sins. Thus he, as well as we, can't blame Adam. No man will stand before God blaming Adam for God uh, sending them to hell. The penalty was removed in Christ. But then the law came in and sin revived and I died. I died in my own sins. Therefore, I was spiritually dead and I had to be made alive. This is why all children go to heaven, because they didn't become accountable to God through the law for their own sins, which were removed in Christ. They didn't die in their own sins. The beginning chapters of Romans clearly taught us the total depravity of man, that man is spiritually dead, therefore he must must be quickened to life first before he can believe, receive, accept, repent, be baptized, or anything else. Regeneration precedes faith. It is not dependent upon it because even faith is a gift. We are born from above, not by the will of man, but of God. Christians by the millions hate the, the truth concerning election. I was sitting around today, you know, I was telling Sue, you know, that in my next video I was getting into chapter 9 and that I, I thought that it would probably be a good idea to just say up front, you know, to everyone, nice knowing you, because I'm sure people are going to leave by the droves. I was in a classroom one time where we had 44 in the class, and the first mention of election, one person yelled out, well, if you're going to talk about election, I'm not going to be here. And about more than half of them got up and walked out. Christians by the droves hate election. But the simple fact of the matter is that they would not want the choice to be theirs. You wouldn't want it to be yours. If it had been left up to you, then you would have never chose Christ to begin with because you were spiritually dead and had to be made alive first, raised from the dead. 
Moreover, if the choice had been, if it had been yours, then salvation would not have been by grace, and we could never say, unto him be all the glory. One cannot present you with a single verse that says, God desires those that he did not elect to become elect by some choice on their part. If it were by our choice, we would not even be having a discussion about this at all, about that word elect, because that word would not even appear in the text. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for listening.